Good morning. Good to have everyone here this morning. Let's stand as we sing. What I'd like to do this morning, though, is before we sing the first song, which is number 70, is sing the doxology in the very front cover of the book. It's the very top left. It says, praise God from all whom blessings flow. It's a very short thing. Just want to sing that first before I give God uh, glory today. Turn over to number 70. Number 70. Holy, holy, holy. open with a word of prayer together, please. Heavenly Father, Savior, you are worthy of praise today. Lord, may this be a building filled of worship. As we shout, holy, holy, holy Lord, may we truly mean it from our hearts, worshiping you with what you deserve, and only you are the one who deserves it. Lord Jesus, you deserve our life our praise, our worship, and every effort that we can muster today to show you just how much we love you. May we do that with our entire might today as we sing, as we turn our hearts to hear your word, Lord. May you stir us into more meaningful relationship with you. 
Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us and demonstrating that love by dying on the cross for us. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As you are, I want to welcome you all and thank you so much for being here at Faith Baptist Church. Our ushers have come forward. They have a connection card and a pen attached to that. And if this is your first time here at Faith Baptist Church, we want to welcome you. And we're going to use that card to do so. So if this is your first time, it's just a little bit for us to get to know you a little bit more. You don't have to fill out the entire thing. This isn't a job application. This is just for us to get to know you a little bit more. And that's all it is, simply that. So the ushers have a pen and a card. Um, so fill out as much as you are comfortable with. And when the offering plate comes in front of you in just a little bit, just drop that card in that plate and keep that pen as a gift from us so we can remember the visit here at Faith Baptist Church. So ushers, would you mind turning around and making your way to the back, looking for brand new faces. And if you, this is your first time or first time in a long time, just raise your hand up high enough. They'll give you one of those cards. And as I said, fill it out as much as you're comfortable with. And on the back of that card is an option for a prayer request. Maybe something's going on in your life that you want pastor to be praying about. And pastor's eyes are going to be the only ones to see that card. So <clears throat> drop that in the offering plate when you see it. Um, grab your bulletins. Hopefully you have one of those. I know Brother Jim was making sure everybody got one. Um, we have just a few announcements, but I um, just wanted to mention about man camp. <laughs> um, we had on Friday and Saturday, uh, the guys who went, went, that went up there, we had a wonderful time. Um, guys, I almost said man camp. <laughs> Um, there's this thing up at man camp that whenever you say man camp, we were supposed to shout back man camp after it. It was, it was, a, it was a wonderful time. I don't know if you saw the slideshow, but uh, there was a slide of uh, Brother Adam and Pastor on these spin top things, a uh, little short little video. It was, it was a blast. We had a great time and looking forward to next year taking another group of guys up there. And the challenges that were laid on our heart, were, they, were, they were spot on. They were great. Um, and just a real challenge to be men for Christ and be men in the family, you know, leading the family as we should. But I also wanted to mention about today as we jump back into the Revelation series, uh, looking forward to that, but also tonight with Faith Builders, uh, the second night of that where we're going to be um, trying to get some questions answered from pastor. Maybe that you have that question that you've always wondered and you don't know what the answer is. Maybe you've Googled it and you can't find an answer and you just want somebody to study the word and answer that for you. Um, there's an opportunity tonight where you'll, pastor is going to be actually ask, answering some of those questions and where you'll be able to submit some of those questions that you might have. Um, so come back tonight for Faith Builders. At 6 o'clock, we'll have a program for adults up here, kids downstairs, something for everyone. So please come on back tonight at 6 o'clock. Also, we have our midweek services. We have prayer meeting up at the farmhouse, a wonderful chance to talk to the Lord and build your relationship with him through prayer. And we also have expeditions for the kids here at the church building, and that's at 7 o'clock, so that way, adults, you can drop your kids off here at 7 and then be up at the farmhouse at 7.15 or 7.20 or whatever you happen to get up there. <laughs> but um, we'll be looking forward to a midweek service this week. Also wanted to mention... Our church business meeting will be next Sunday, but also addition to that, we're going to be having a luncheon. So ladies, you have that favorite dish that a whole entire church family knows that you make and that is delicious. Please bring that dish. There's actually a sign-up sheet on the back by the offering box over by the water bottles. If you would, wouldn't mind bringing something to that luncheon, just fill out your name and what you're going to bring on that sign-up sheet, and we're just going to have a small luncheon after the morning service next week, and then after the luncheon, we're going to have the actual business meeting. So if you are online and you have a dish that you wanted to bring and that you're planning on being here, um, just, just send Sherry a text just saying, hey, I'm going to come, I'm going to bring um, a casserole or whatever it is just to let her know that you're going to be planning on bringing a dish. But <clears throat> we'll be looking forward to the business meeting and making the decisions for the next annual um, coming up. Also wanted to mention the teen corn maze, October 29th. Teens, I've been mentioning it for a while. Please let me know that you're going to come. As of now, nobody is coming to the corn maze. So <laughs> it's just going to be Rebecca and I and Felicity and Elizabeth, and we're going to have a great old time. <laughs> 
but uh, I know that you're probably all planning on coming, um, but just, just let me know. Um, you can even have your parents text me or you can come up to me after the service and let me know and just say, hey, I'm coming and I'm gonna bring 10 friends. Great, bring your 10 friends, we're gonna have a great time. But we're just, let, just to let you know, it's gonna be about 15 bucks and that's gonna cover the corn maze and we're gonna come back to the farmhouse and we're gonna burn some hot dogs over the campfire and just have um, s'mores and uh, hopefully some hot chocolate too. We're gonna have a good time October 29th. You're not gonna wanna miss out. Um, <clears throat> so that'll be starting in the afternoon and that's gonna go to the evening time just so you have an idea of what that time is. So it's not coming up this weekend, but next weekend. So you have a little bit of time. Um, to talk to your friends and get them interested in coming. So that does it for my announcements. Um, I'm pretty sure. I don't think I'm missing anything, but Paul's going to come with our next song. Let's turn our hymn books to number 420, Bringing in the Sheaves, number 420. Let's pray for the offering. Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege that we have to be gathered together in your house. Lord, we are reminded by the songs that we've sung about who you are. And it never ceases to amaze that a perfect, thrice holy God could love us, much less allow us to be part of your family and to serve you, to be your hands and your feet. Father, we ask that you would take these offerings that are presented today and use them to fulfill that mission of bringing in the sheaves. For Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Let's turn our hymn books to 198. Number 198, there is power in the blood. Let's stand as we sing. Let's sing the first, second, and last verse, please.
Were you all listening to the same thing I was just listening to? There you go. That's a little bit better. Man, God's people rejoice and say, goodness gracious. Those things don't happen on accident. I will tell you this. God received glory. Praise the Lord. So glad you're here today. Thankful for the full building. Before we dismiss the kids for junior church, and of course, Brother Mark Samples and Sister Cindy Samples are still on their short break before they start working with the kids again. So with Pastor Matt up here, we've got the kids upstairs. And so could you help me out just a little bit? Each week, um, the Lord is doing incredible things among us. He really is. And I'm sensing it not just when I'm here in the building. I'm experiencing it when I'm with you. It's exciting. There's been many months of hard work being put into the ministry with very little yield. And we're starting to see that yield, and it's incredible. And so would you help me, please, if you start to notice the building getting this full, slide in if you could. We'll send out an SOS. Scoot over some. These are good days, and so sometimes you just need to slide over. I'll tell you a quick story. Years ago, our church family, New Christians, had gone back to the town that my parents grew up in. And it was the biggest deal of their lives stepping into that little Baptist church in Launce, Michigan, because my parents had never gone there, but they had grown up there. They had met Christ living in Wisconsin and had gone back to see family, and Dad was taking us to church on Sunday. We were nervous, but we were excited. My parents were thrilled. We went in. No one hardly said hi to us. We looked around for a seat. None seemed more welcoming than the cold pew that we found, so we sat in it. And we thought we were safe. No one was coming in and saying hello. We're talking about the Upper Peninsula, where guests don't go. And we were sitting in this pew, feeling nervous, insecure, not sure if we would be accepted or rejected by this group of believers. And I'm sure they were feeling the same way. They weren't used to seeing guests, so they were feeling insecure, feeling like, you know, what do I say to them? If you're not sure when you see a guest, let me give you just a quick hint. Hi works really great. <laughs> if you want to really go over the top, you could say, it's nice to see you. If you want to go way over the tops, you can throw your name out there. But I mean, that's, you could probably die if you did that. I understand. <laughs> that's terrifying. I get it. We're sitting in a pew. No one is saying hi to us. Finally, a lady comes up. And I'm a young boy at this point. But I thought, oh, good. Someone is coming up to us. She came and she stood in front of my parents. She put her hands on her hips and she said, you're sitting in my pew. We looked around. She said, that's my pew. We got up. We moved pews. We sat back down and we thought, we'll never come back here again. Y'all don't own a pew, right? You sit in one. I love it. It's like, where are, who's, where are you guys? Some of you, you have your spots. And some of you, you just mess with me every once in a while. I don't know what you're doing. You're not in your normal spot. But if the only seats that we have left, and if you take a look around this auditorium in, in, in a general sense, there's but few scattered seats. The only true empty rows we have, as close as we can get to it, is this right here. And so obviously we need a new building, but it's going to be uncomfortable till we get in that new building. We don't want people to come and say, oh man, it was so full, I won't be missed if I'm not there. It's one of the best things you can do. Flag someone down if they're looking for a seat. Think about others before yourself. Scoot over some if you can, all right? So with that said, let's go and dismiss the kids' junior church and younger, sixth grade, sorry, sixth grade and younger downstairs for junior church. All you young folks get to go down with Pastor Matt and Rebecca. He was working on stuff I saw when I came in this morning. Pastor Matt's putting his whole art into that class every single week and doing a really great job. Sixth grade and younger, you guys get to go downstairs. If you want to stay up with mom and dad, that's okay. You don't have to go downstairs. But you can believe me when I say, and adults, you don't need to amen this. They'll have more fun down there than we do up here. Thank you for not amening that. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you would, please. Oh, okay. We need to butter the biscuit just a little bit more. This one's going to be fun. This one is thrilling. The name of this series was not my idea. It was Pastor Matt's. He and I sat down and I talked about the roadmap for the series and what I was going to do and how we were going to accomplish it. We were getting into Revelation. Pastor Matt actually made all of the, the you see on the, 
the slideshow, that, I don't know what you, advertisement, I don't know what, what else you'd call it, that logo and all of that that he made, he came up with the title uh, for the series, and the title of the message is the name of the series, which Pastor Matt called it, The King Still Reigns. And so if you would please, with all the enthusiasm your fingers can muster, would you please turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 5. My expectation is that every heart that is here, those that have never regarded God, those that sometimes regard God, and those that are saturated with God are all going to very deeply connect with Revelation chapter 5. And I fully expect that the Lord is going to transform us before we're done with this message. Uh, in my preparation and studying, you'll be relieved to know that I literally cut this text into two because there was no possible way we were going to preach Revelation chapter 5 all in one sitting. In just a moment, I'll introduce you to the text. I'm going to read the entire chapter because it's so awesome. We're not going to start the message. We're just going to read the text, and then I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to take you back to another passage to start the sermon. And we'll go from there. So that you guys have the context of Revelation 5. I feel like it's been a while. Our family had this stomach flu. You know, a cold, fever, cough, all those things, that's fine. Stomach flu, I quit. I'm out. I'm done. <laughs> You're on your own. I do not like the stomach flu. And, and, and as much as I hate it, I feel that much more strongly about sharing it with anybody. So, you know, hopefully, Lord willing, you'll get through this season. But just know that evil is out there. And it comes through our children and comes into our households and makes us horribly ill. All right. So a um, little bit of business to take care of. Uh, I received, uh, and some of you, you're going to be completely shocked and surprised by this. I get anonymous letters Fairly regularly, they come. Most of the time, from everything that I can tell, just by the content alone, um, they're not from our church family. No possible way. I, I received a letter from a gentleman today who hand wrote 22 pages of questions for me to look at. And I've never met the man. You'd be surprised the stuff that, that comes in. I, I got a couple letters this morning, and Pastor Matt said, don't open them till after church. Just joking around. I said, ah, it's fine. So I opened up the letters and, you know, the one, it was like, whoa, that's 22 pages. I'm going to have to sit down and read that one. All handwritten notes. Not sure what's going on there. Um, but then I got an anonymous one. It's unsigned. And I only mention this because I, I don't know that someone from our church sent this to me. But can I just encourage you, don't ever send anonymous notes, ever. If it's worthy of being said, sign your name to it. Someone sent me an anonymous letter, and I am telling you, I could not agree more with the content of this letter. It did not need to be sent anonymously. And so Pastor Matt and I were talking, and, he, you know, we love you guys. And he's like, there's just no way anyone, there's just no way someone sent you an anonymous note. It's like, oh, I don't know. I'll mention it just in case. Because in the past, in the, in, in the last 15 years, and you'll never be able to guess at what time in, in our period it was, I, I've, had, I've had notes left on my desk unsigned, and it's just like, if you got something to say, let me know. You know. One thing I work really hard at is remaining approachable. And if you take that for granted, that's great. You wouldn't even know that there are pastors that you'd be terrified to speak to. And maybe there's topics you're afraid to ask about because you're embarrassed, but I hope you know that you can always come up to me, always. And if you're nervous about it, it just might be the Holy Spirit saying, don't say that. Think about it. If you can sign your name to it, it ought to be said. Now, with that said, this letter is outstanding. There are three proposals that are coming on the ballot. I don't know if you've looked into this stuff yet, but you need to. Now, Brother Tim Schmig famously said one time from our pulpit, if you're not sure, just vote no. Because almost always things are going fine. The, our, you know, a lot of our problem is the changes that we want to make. And so when, whenever, if you're not sure, because sometimes things get worded and then they get crossed. And so this is, um, in fact, I saw a piece of mail. I told Terry, I got to talk to the church about this. So there are three proposals. I just want to talk about the third one. If you're not familiar with proposal number three, it's related to whether or not um, well, basically, is the state of Michigan, now that the Supreme Court punted the authority back to the states, is the state of Michigan going to protect the rights of abortion, the ability to terminate a viable pregnancy, from our perspective and from God's word, the murder of the unborn, 
Or are we going to have to enforce a law that was in place in the 1930s? Now, just so you know, Michigan has a law on the books that says that abortion is utterly illegal. It is the murder of human beings. And it is adequately written. But when it came time to enforce it, a judge in the state of Michigan said, we're not going to enforce that law. It's too old. It's antiquated. This needs to be revisited. And so we live in a, in a time when we define what good is. And so the whole idea was we're going to put it on the ballot. I have seen advertisements suggesting that Proposal 3 is actually supposed to limit and protect people and that it, it's, it's a restriction on abortion. That is not true at all. Now, if you are pro-choice, which is a really nice way of saying pro-abortion, and I don't mean to shame you, I mean to challenge you from God's word. He gives life. And who am I to stand, having gotten to enjoy 40 years of it? And trust me, being born to two broke people in the Upper Peninsula was not convenient for my parents. For me to stand here, having gotten to live and suggest that others shouldn't or can't is of the greatest hypocrisy mankind has ever heard whisper. Who are we to get to live and suggest that others' lives are an inconvenience to us? Now, I get it. Pregnancy is complicated, and the issues are complicated. But know this. The Almighty rejoices at every life that is born, regardless of its context. Every life. And so I challenge you, to take God's perspective on this thing. Now, all I want to do is make this super clear for you all. And if you are, you're pro-abortion and you have the courage because you believe you're right, call me sometime. I will pay for lunch and we will have a hoot and any good time talking about it. I want to show you what the Bible says because I, I genuinely believe that the only conclusions you can come to on this issue would be devoid of God's opinion on it. I really do believe that. We could get into the scriptures, but for the sake of time, let me just make it super clear. If you vote yes on Proposal 3, you are legalizing abortion in the state of Michigan without restriction. Listen to me, without restriction. There are no restrictions according to Proposal 3. There's a little bit of language that they threw in there, which said basically, you know, if you cause harm or whatever but it's all qualified by whether or not you have the right to choose, and Proposal 3 says you have the right to choose. And so often politicians will create confusing language because they literally hope to win the other side with confusion, right? I want to confuse you into thinking you know what you're voting for. So let's just be perfectly clear. Proposal 3, if you vote yes, is an approval on terminating the life of infants inside of a mother's belly, period, okay? And if you vote no, you are turning that away. Now, election season's coming up. There are some pretty big issues. And right now, we're trying to figure out. We either want to, we are talking about this as men while we were gone. Um, the camp director got up and he said this, and, and I want to talk more about this. This got me. Maybe this will get you too. I'll mention it in passing. Jesus, when he, when he had purged the temple, you remember, he was saying, take these things, hence make not my father's house a house of merchandise, and he quotes an Old Testament text, and he says, my father's house shall be called the house of prayer. But here's what's really interesting. Camp director Aaron Wilson, he said that, he goes, you know what's interesting? He said, Jesus doesn't say, my house shall be called the house of preaching. He says, my house shall be called the house of prayer. And that got me, because I mean, let's face it, what do we do that's the biggest today? The preaching. We come here to hear preaching. We come here to think about preaching. We come here to meditate on preaching, to go back home and talk about the preaching to ignore it or to submit to it. But who actually spends time in prayer while they're here? And he got me with that. And I thought, yeah, this is God's property. He owns it. And so let this be a place of prayer. So we are either going to do a 24 hours of prayer at the election season where you can sign up. We've done that in the past. And if we do the 24 hours of prayer, there are some night watch. We want someone praying every single hour about the election process November 8th for God's will to be accomplished the gospel to be spread, and for men to begin to answer to God once again, for intervention, right? 
Um, so we're either going to do 24 hours of prayer and we'll have you sign up. There'll be slots and you can sign up. Those night watches are the tough ones, but they're special. Those that sign up for those night watches, you'll be a watchman on the wall. You'll sign up for those night watches. You'll set your alarm and you'll get up at 3 a.m. and you'll pray for God's mercy and for his grace on our nation and on us as a people. We'll either do 24 hours of prayer or we will open up the building and we will allow you to come as part of your voting process to come and pray. And we're not going to put it to a vote, but I would be interested to hear those that are enthusiastic about this idea, let me know. Because if you'd say, man, I really want to come to the building, I encourage you to come right to the front. The building will be empty. You'll come to the front. You can get down on your knees and you can pray and ask for God's mercy. And if there is anything good that comes of it, we'll know it's because we prayed. So we'll either open the building or we'll do 24 hours of prayer wherever you are. So let me know what, what you'd be interested in. Grab my hand while we're fellowshipping today and just say, oh, I want to do the 24-hour thing. Or, oh, I want the building open. And we'll kind of get a sense for it, just talking to people. I may even ask you if I haven't heard your opinion. I may want to know what it is. And then we'll do one of those. So you can plan on that, and we'll be praying. If you ever have questions about proposals, and by the way, um, here's my personal endorsement. Um, I personally will be voting no on all three of those. So it's, it's your choice. And I'm not trying to bully you. I'm not trying to take that away. I'm not telling you you're a bad church member if you don't. I'm just letting you know. Your pastor, your spiritual mentor, and your guide, the leader of this assembly, is personally voting no on all three of those things. And if you have questions about it, those aren't positions of ignorance for me. They're positions of passion. I'm happy to talk to you about them and know that I will not attack you. I'd love to just simply be able to talk to you about it. So, is that enough? No? Okay, we can keep on going if you'd like. <laughs> Want to talk about proposal two? No, I'm just kidding. All right, so with all of that said, Revelation chapter 5. Let's stand for this text. It's too good to sit. We'll do this a little bit differently because I'd like for you to stay engaged if possible. Let's do every other verse. I'll read a verse and then you read in response. We'll read this entire text together from top to bottom, all 14 incredible verses. And then I'll pray. The moment I'm done praying, you all may be seated. I'll read the first verse you read in response. Uh, we are in the King James Version. That's the version that I preach from. And so if you're wondering if you're on a tablet or a, a phone, if you're wondering what version are we in, just switch to King James Version Download it. It's going to take a little bit. You'll have it by verse number 14, okay? So with that said, I'll read verse number one. You respond with verse number two. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And he came, and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders 
And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Oh, Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would not just bless the reading of the word today. Not just the preaching of the word today but the living of your word in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Isn't that a good text? I almost made you guys reread your part where you were supposed to yell. I wanted to hear that. I want to hear an assembly yell those words. But I think no matter how large the audience, it'll never compare to what we're going to experience one day. If you would, please... Take your Bibles for just the time being. You can hold your finger. We're going to be in Revelation 5 this morning. But just go over for a moment to John chapter 10. And I want to make sure that you understand the significance of what you are reading. That is to say why you are reading it. I encourage you to come back tonight to Faith Builders. We're going to tackle the heaven question. More specifically, and I know it's like, where is heaven? When is heaven? What is heaven? What is it like? More specifically, we're going to talk about the development of heaven because I think in our heads it's just you die and then you go to heaven, but it's way more complicated than that. There isn't just one heaven. There is absolutely two for sure. And there is a possibility that there's a third, and I want to show those to you tonight. And so we're going to study heaven, and I, I hope that it inspires more questions. I've already gotten, I think, probably 10 or 12 cards back so far. Some of the questions I'll be able to answer in two to three minutes, and some of them I hope we can do it in one entire lesson. It's so really, really awesome questions coming in. We'll have those cards available for you tonight. So you come back to Faith Builders. We're going to talk about what heaven is, more specifically how many there are, and then you'll have a chance. Maybe one of those questions has popped up in your mind and I would encourage you, you know, we live in the smartphone age. If one of those questions occurs to you during the week, stop everything you're doing and put it in your phone. And then on Sunday, you'll remember to write that on a card because I don't want to miss these questions. I love knowing what you're going through during the week and what you're struggling with when it comes to understanding God's ways. And so that'll be tonight. Uh, and so I want to make sure you understand the scene that we just read. I, I don't know that I'd ever heard this explained this way, but once you hear it, you won't unsee it, and it's obvious. So let's look at John chapter 10. This is during the life of Jesus, for sake of context. We'll start in verse number 23. I want you to see what he says in verse number 27 and 28. John 10, 23, And Jesus walked into the temple in Solomon's porch, then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be Christ, tell us plainly. And if you didn't know this, Christ means Messiah. Messiah is a promise that God had made all the way. He made it to David, but he also made it to Abraham. In fact, he made it to Eve in the garden. And so the Jews are waiting for the Messiah to come. Their expectation that the Messiah is going to be the king of kings who beats all the kings that are alive at that time and makes the Jews the most powerful people on earth. And so that's what they were waiting for. And so they come to him like, just tell us. You're being coy. You're showing power like you are, but you're not announcing yourself that you're the king of kings. And so tell us, are you the promise that God made that the Jews would one day rule all people? Are you the king of the kings? Jesus answering them, uh, Jesus answered them, verse number 25, I told you, and you believe not. You have to go back to chapter 6 and chapter 9 
When Jesus declares himself to be the I am and even says, Abraham and Moses longed to see the day that I would live. They ached for it. We're going to talk about that tonight. What is the significance of that statement? Or at least more specifically, what I believe the significance of that statement is and the potential for a third space where uh, dead saints dwelled in the past. Um, But he told them, I'm he. And so he says in verse number 25, I told you and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you believe not because you are not of my sheep as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now, we know that you do not enter into God's kingdom because you've done good works. Sin must be paid. That's why Christ died. And so Paul just wonderfully breathes out as God's Spirit breathes through him. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians chapter 2. And so it is here that Jesus says... You don't enter into my kingdom because you've maintained a life that's good enough. You enter into my kingdom because you know me and I call you friend. And how is it that we could ever know Christ to that degree but to ask him to save us from that which destroys us, to put your confidence in the king. My sheep hear my voice. Here's what's awesome. When Jesus returns for the resurrection, he doesn't set foot on earth. That's why we do not call it the second coming. You'll see later on in the book of Revelation, we're going to talk about the second coming of Christ. And boy, oh boy, you guys, does Jesus come back in thunder. My goodness, when the Lord returns, you are going to see this which men walked all over with their conversations will shake when he comes on his horse to reclaim earth as his own. We call it the second coming. But when Jesus comes for the resurrection... To take all those saints who are but souls right now and to give them a body, that day is coming. Right now, they are disembodied saints. They're disembodied souls. Cherry's dad died and went to be with Jesus because as a young child, Cherry's dad asked God, would you please forgive me? I've sinned. That was my job at his funeral. I read his salvation testimony. He had put it out in print in preparation for his own death because he wanted to preach the gospel at his own funeral. And he talked about how his mother led him to Christ. And he asked Jesus to save him and knew that he lived a life forgiven because Christ had died and rose from the dead. And so Cherry's dad is in heaven, not because he was a good man, certainly not a perfect man, but because he had been redeemed. And so we saw his body, but he wasn't there. When Jesus comes back, he won't set foot on the ground because he doesn't need to. Have you ever tried to catch a chicken before? You'd be nuts to call a chicken to you, right? You might be able to hand train a pet pet hen to come. But in a coop of chickens, you're going to spend all your time chasing those things around, right? I was uh, talking to someone recently in our church family who's raised quail. I saw them as little chicks running around. And my first question is like, What do you do when they get out? And it's like, try not to let them get out. It's not good when quail go because they can run. Jesus isn't coming to collect that which doesn't know him. He's coming to collect that which survives because of him. It's like, how familiar am I with the existence of Jesus? I can't pray without mentioning his name. And so he doesn't have to come and collect all the hens. All he has to do is come close. And he's going to call us with his own voice, come up hither, come to me. And my sheep, my sheep, my believers, those who've put their trust in me, their own physical bodies and the laws that I have made the universe under cannot govern or prevent the affection that I have between I and them. Not even gravity itself is going to stop us from being with Jesus. When the creator who made gravity comes in the clouds and says, come on, guys. It's such instantaneous submission that when he says it, the apostle Paul says, that obedience will happen in the twinkling of an eye. 
at the last trump, the sound of the trump, the dead in Christ will rise. How awesome is that? The dead in Christ. We don't have control over these bodies, let alone once they're dead. And yet when the maker of all things comes to the clouds and says, let's go, the dust itself will jump up at the obedience of the creator. He won't have to chase us like hens on the loose. He'll just call us. And so know this, if you don't know Jesus, you will not know his voice when he comes. And he says, there's a lot of you that don't know me. And so I'm not here to sell myself to those that don't know me. I'm here to be there for those that do. Do you know Jesus? I mean, know him. You say, oh, I know about him. That's not what I said. I didn't say, do you know about him? Have you, have you cried out to him and asked him to save you? Have you put your confidence in the fact that he's strong enough to redeem you, even from your worst failures, and make you a part of God's family? Go back to Revelation chapter 5. I'm not just burning time. We are setting the scene for something you've never understood before. When I preached Revelation chapter 4, which would be one, two, two messages ago, we talked about how John experiences, he's, he's been talking with Jesus in what appears to be some sort of incredible space. He said, I'm in the spirit and I hear this voice and I turn around and I see him and he's the alpha and he's the omega. And I start talking to him and I realize that he's the Christ. Now remember, no one knew Jesus as good as John did. Not, not Paul, certainly not. Paul actually met Jesus after Jesus had died and rose again, so he didn't know him. Peter certainly knew Jesus, but John is the one who wrote in his own gospel, I am the one whom Jesus loved. Peter, James, and John were the closest to Jesus, and they spent more time with him during his ministry than any other human beings on earth. But even John, in Jesus' glorified vessel, missed who he was. Jesus had to reveal himself. He tells him to write the letters. Then we go to chapter 4, and what does John say? I was taken up into heaven. Sounds a lot like the resurrection, doesn't it? So here's what's awesome. The resurrection occurs. And by the way, there is no other time in the book of Revelation where the church-age saints are identified as a group except right here. You're going to see us doing other things, but an introduction into heaven and something significant taking place. And by the way, for us, something significant must take place and is recorded. And I'll explain to you why that is, but there's no other time in the book of Revelation. Even the people that die without accepting the Antichrist during that great testing period will die and be identified as hiding under the altar wearing special clothes. And the saints will say, what's going on? And they will cry from under the altar, Lord Jesus, how long before you avenge those who have killed us for not turning our back on you? These are different saints. These are tested saints. These are those which have come to Christ at the cost of their own lives. They do not live and they have not died yet. We do not know who they are, but they will occur. And so catch this. What happens in heaven when you go from disembodied saints to people that have been made whole once again. You see, Christ made a promise. He said that I will provide a resurrection for you. And when we die, we get to go to heaven, we think, boom, there it is. No, it's not. The promise isn't fully completed yet. He protects our souls. He keeps us from falling into hell. He brings us into paradise to be with him and his father. But the resurrection hasn't happened yet. Cherry's dad, who passed away several years ago, has been hanging out in heaven as a non-physical creature. And then all of a sudden, and does that happen for three years, five years, 12 years, 100 years? You think about a guy like Moses. He's been up there for 3,500 years, disembodied. And Jesus is going to say, all that are mine, come forth. Boom, full resurrection. And Moses is going to have a body again. He's going to experience heaven in a way that he hasn't yet. What you read in Revelation chapter 5 is the worship service of rejoicing because Jesus Christ has completed his promise and disembodied souls are now physical people once again. That's why they start worshiping in a way that you're like, well, how come they're not doing that right now? 
because they haven't experienced all the good that Christ has yet to offer. Not yet. And so now you read the resurrection in chapter 5 and the big gratitude explosion service. Know that these are people that are worshiping Christ with all their hearts because he's made them whole again. They're not just souls. They are perfected. And can you imagine? It's like, man, alive. No aches, no pains. We're just talking about this. Um, we're talking about aches and pains on, uh, at man camp. And uh, I actually have multiple, I have several broken, broken bones still in my hands, which I didn't know about. I got hurt at work. And um, I, had, I had cracked this bone at work. It got crushed between steel. And so they were taking x-rays of this bone, but they happened to take x-rays of several different bones. And the doctor is, he's like looking at this. It's like, uh, no, bud, uh, first you're medical student, I'm guessing, because it's down here, not up there, you know? And he's playing with my finger. He's like, does this hurt? And I'm like, no. And he's pulling. He's like, flex it for me. Make a fist. I made a fist. He's like, does that hurt? I was like, no, he goes, are you sure? It doesn't hurt at all. I said, no, he's wiggling it. He's getting a little more aggressive with it. I said, doc, it doesn't hurt at all because that finger is broken. I was like, what? He takes the thing, puts it up, and he shows me. Clean, it's broken right at the knuckle. Clean through, clean broken. And I was like, no, it doesn't hurt. He said, did you play sports? I said, I played football. He goes, you probably broke it in high school. Do you remember a time? I was like, well, all my fingers were hurting all the time. And he's like, well, that one was broken. You probably should have had something done with it. And I was like, what can I do with it now? He goes, well, you could have surgery, but I mean, if it doesn't hurt you, it is what it is. Ah, we're fine. I'm 24. We're good. Oh, this finger aches. When a storm is coming, this hand, I don't even know. I must have slept and hurt this one. Because this one, like lately, it's been hurting to make a fist. You know what I mean? And it's just like, this is just a taste of what is to come. Bad backs, acid reflux, weight problems. Great to be alive, you know? Testify, have I touched on yours yet? Autoimmune disorders, bad eyes. Do I need to keep going? Have you found yours yet? You know? It's a bummer. You imagine resurrection. Boom, this body is here. Christ has given them a body in an instant. They are with Jesus and they're like, I mean, Moses, it's like, I haven't seen these in 3,500 years. I thought they ached a lot more than they do. You know what I mean? Like, wow! And so there's this celebration service that occurs. Like, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive honor and glory and blessing and power. For he has redeemed us to the Father and he's made us whole again. That's what this worship service is. And we read it and we're like, oh yeah, they're all happy about Jesus being there. No, you're totally missing it. He has made us whole again. And yet in the context of all of this experience, John is completely overwhelmed. And he sets this stage with Revelation 5. And he's like the solo actor explaining his experiences. And in so doing, absolutely nails our own. I'd like to show you the three scenes of the play that John plays out for us. That's right. In all of that, we have not even started the formal sermon yet. Don't worry, it should move fairly swiftly. I've said that before. It might. Scene number one. You listen fast, I'll preach fast, and we'll get out of here before lunchtime. How's that sound? All right, season number, or, uh, scene number one. By the way, the king still reigns. That's what we're looking at today. Here's the first scene as we realize that the king still reigns, and this is one you're not probably expecting. Number one, scene number one, being nervous means you're normal. Being nervous means you're normal. Have you ever been nervous about the things of the Lord, about the things of the future and the things of God? Have you ever been nervous about whether or not you deserve to be saved, whether or not you actually are if you're qualified to be? Have you ever been nervous having let sin in your life and wondering if Jesus will ever take it back out again? Have you been nervous at the thought of praying, thinking that God isn't going to hear you or that other Christians might judge you or that at the end of the day, I'm faking it all. And you think I'm so unnatural. You know, everyone is so strong in faith and everyone is so accomplished in faith. Let's get into the text. And and, and if you would, please experience his nervousness. Now, we need to paint this out because what, what, what he describes in verse 1 is going to cover a lot of the book of Revelation. It's going to launch all of the end times. And so we have in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, this description, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne 
a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And you're going to see this sealed book, but I want to, I'll use my sermon just to kind of help you understand it. The only books that John understood, which God allowed him to see and appears to be the kind that the Lord prefers in heaven, isn't the kind that we're used to. We think of a book, which, by the way, you never think about how this is made. There's actually a process to this. At one point, when this became the format, every page had to be hand-stitched into the book. Now, it can be run through machines with super sticky glue and shoved into this thing, and it falls apart after a few years. But the way that books were written, and the way that it's described, the way that books were written in John's life, is not that it was a book like this, but a book like this. It's a scroll. So John sees the Almighty sitting in his throne. We looked at that in chapter 4. Go back and listen to the message if you haven't listened to it yet. He's sitting in heaven on his seat, and there's a scroll in the hand. Now, a king with a scroll, that's his edict. That is the declaration of his sovereign rule, right? It's information that is necessary and precious, and he's holding it. And the way that they would seal something like this is literally, as you're rolling it up, you get to the first portion, which would be the last portion, and you seal it. Then you come to the second to the last portion, and you seal it. And you come to the third to the last portion, and you seal it. You come to the fourth part, which is going to be the third part, and you seal it. And they just put wax and sealed it like this. So there's seven progressive seals on this scroll in the hand of God. And you're going to have to have the authority to break the seal that the king has placed on that document. And when he looks at it, he sees there's writing, but he can't tell what it is. And it's loaded. It's on the inside, which is normal. It's on the outside, which isn't normal. That is to suggest that the things that God has planned for us is more than we could ever imagine, both front and back filled, suggesting that that which we get to see in heaven, which is the inside of the scroll in the book of Revelation, there is an entire backside that we don't get to see. Would it shock you to find out that God has a plan past a million years from our resurrection? You say, well, what is it? I don't know. We got to get through this portion first. But just know that God doesn't stop doing things. You say, oh man, that gets me excited. Is he going to make another earth? Is he gonna... I don't know what he's going to do, and I wouldn't peradventure to guess what the Almighty has planned. It would be foolish to try and figure out what's on the backside of that scroll. But know this, Revelation doesn't cover it all. Not even close. Let's keep reading. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? like the sword and the stone, right? Anybody is willing to come up and take their chance. And what do you risk? Well, embarrassment. You all nervous about, what if I called you up right now? What if I have someone in mind right now, and I called you up and I said, would you please tell us about when you met Jesus the first time? You'd be like, please don't do that to me. And as I'm looking at each one of you, you're like, it's not me, is it? Right? We got what? 70, 80 people in here right now? Could you imagine? I mean, he cries out, anybody willing? No man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon, and I wept much. Now, he's in heaven. You're like, there's no, he can't be nervous. He wouldn't be nervous. There's no need to be nervous. It's not possible because we're all going to be perfect. We're never going to be nervous because nervous isn't normal. Wrong. I was sitting in a tree stand uh, last week, and I was watching the leaves blow, and it occurred to me. Have you ever seen a mighty oak tree ripped down by a tornado? Have you ever seen that before? How about one that's been ripped in half? Have you ever seen a, a, a mighty 50 or 100 or 120-year-old oak tree ripped in half before? I have. And you don't look at that oak tree and stand there like this and go, hmm, four foot at the base, big tall limbs, weighs tens of thousands of pounds. That's a pretty weak tree. It got ripped apart by wind. That's not your normal reaction, is it? What is the normal reaction when you see a mighty oak tree that's been decimated? You say, what kind of wind did that? That wind was stronger than that tree. I will tell you this. Satan's winds are blowing. And the leaves shake when the wind blows because they're not as strong. They're going to do it. 
We weren't made almighty. We're made feeble, weak, incapable of seeing the future for sure. Half blinded when it comes to the present. And how many of you ever get frustrated about not being able to remember the past? And yet an infinite amount of knowledge it takes to manage these things. Man, when the wind blows, the leaves shake. I'm not even a tree. I'm not even a sapling. I'm a leaf off on the end of the breach, uh, off on the end of the branch. And sometimes when these things, these big, heavy things start happening, man, I get nervous thinking about it. You say, you do? Yes, I do. So did John. And by the way, so should you. It's normal. Is that shocking to hear that it's normal to be nervous? It shouldn't be. Adam was nervous because he was unclothed and had sinned. Abraham was nervous because at 98 years old, he still hadn't had one son. Moses was nervous because he was nothing but a shepherd with a stuttering problem. Joshua was nervous because he was no Moses. Israel was nervous because there were giants in the land. Saul was nervous because Samuel hadn't showed up for the sacrifice on time. David was nervous because Saul wanted to kill him, as well as his own sons. Isaiah was nervous because he saw God's unfettered glory. Esther was nervous about standing up for Israel to the king. Joseph was nervous about marrying, uh, Joseph was nervous about marrying Mary. What are people going to think? The shepherds were nervous when the angels proclaimed Jesus' birth. The disciples were nervous when Jesus walked on the water, and Peter was more nervous when he tried to do it himself. It will shock you to find that Jesus was nervous as he prepared to die on the cross while he cried out to his Father. Being nervous is normal. It's a product of being weak. But I've got great news. The king still reigns. I would actually say this. If you fight the awareness of being nervous, you are spiritually stunted in your growth. And I know, you think, it's the problem, it's the problem, it's the problem. You know what's amazing when we talk about our own abilities? We can't, by taking thought, add one inch to our stature. I've tried. It doesn't work. Five <clears throat> is all right, but six, anything, would be wonderful. And no matter how hard I wish, and those of you that are six, whatever, look at five, whatever, and say it's not that bad, easy for you to say you have six, whatever. Try five, whatever sometime. It's not that great. Six, whatever, is dynamite. I'll take six flat. I'll take five, 11, and seven, eights. I don't even need the six. I just want to be taller than I am. More importantly, taller than my brother's. I think I'm five eight and a half, but if this is going out online and my brothers are watching, I'm five nine and a half. We can't, by thought, increase our existence by but one inch, one seventieth of what I am. I can't add to it. We don't even consciously control our heartbeat, our breathing, or even our blinking. But we think that we can mentally handle the things that Satan has planned for this world. It's all right to be nervous. I don't deserve to be in heaven. It's all right to be nervous. I have a really bad habit of never talking to the Almighty. And so I'm afraid that when he comes, he's going to miss me because he doesn't, I don't ever talk to him. It's all right to be nervous. Nervousness takes us to the ridge of God's goodness, and you fall on one side or the other. There is goodness on this side and there is destruction on this side and nervousness takes us to the place of decision. It is those that are never nervous that never find the will of God. And I'm not saying, oh good, I'm nervous. I could just be nervous all the time. I'm nervous Nelson. No. But know that nervous is accepting the reality that this is too much for me. And you will never know how great God is if you never realize that you're in serious trouble when it comes to the things that are coming. It is good and right and God-glorifying to be nervous because it sets the stage for the Almighty. John was nervous. He's looking all over the place. The loud angel cries and he's like, is there anybody? And he, sa he says, man, they looked everywhere in creation to find one person, one 
that could, and there were none. And I was nervous. Those nerves took him to a whole new emotional response that we're not used to. But know this, there are almost 7,500 promises that God makes to us in the Bible where he says, I will do this for you. 7,500 times. The maker wouldn't give us 7,500 promises if he didn't know that we are nervous people and we need reassurance. I'm not telling you to be nervous, stay nervous. I'm telling you to realize there are good reasons to be, but let me show you where God wants to actually take you because nervous is only the first scene. Listen to me. Some of you are not nervous enough. Get nervous. He could return today. You will be standing in front of the Almighty answering for all these things, caught aware or unaware. You will not prevent him from his return. Some of you sit here knowing, knowing, not concerned that maybe, but knowing that you're lost, but hoping to deceive those around you into believing that you're saved because if they believe it, then maybe I just might be. But if you don't cry out and ask Jesus to save you, you're not. And if you cry out and ask Jesus to save you, then guess what? You are. You say, well, I am and I did, but I'm still nervous. That's normal. Now, we, see, we hear normal and we think acceptable. No, it's normal. That's what happens at first. But God is not done. We go from nervous to grieved. So, scene number two, being grieved is a sign of righteousness. Are you invested in the things of God enough to know that when they may not happen, it breaks your heart? It should. And if not, it's probably because you're not nervous enough. And so a natural outpouring in his life is, and if you look at it in verse 4, you see that nervousness in verse 3, do you see it now? And no man in heaven nor on earth nor either under the earth was able to open the book, neither loose the seals thereof. You hear it? I mean, he's nervous as he's writing it. There's no answer to this problem. We've looked everywhere. He's scared. But he goes from scared to grieved because this is the glory of God unfolding. And so, verse number four, I wept much. Have you ever wept much in your life? I'm not talking about the occasional tear, like, oh man, I think I feel a tear coming on. I get that shaky feeling and, you know, oh no. I think I might, oh, yep, there, it just went down my cheek. No, we're talking about sobbing. I wept much. Why? Because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. The almighty edicts of God, none could satisfy. It caused me to break. It's funny how little we care about the things of God now, everyone will care about the things of God then. When you're no longer here worried about whether or not they're going electric or staying with engines in the new Dodge muscle cars. I mean, you think anyone's going to care about that in heaven? Right? All the things that we get so interested in work, like the Green Bay Packers, like who cares? The Detroit Lions, I mean, not obviously who cares, but I mean, who cares, right? A raise at work? Or a bigger house? You will be in front of the Almighty, and what He wants, what He has planned, is what will move everybody. And John is grieved because John has been made righteous, and the world is not righteous, and it is not bringing glory to God the way that it deserves. The glory of God has been relegated to a corner of heaven. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is the reality. This is what we are dealing with, and this is what we are living in. Um, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy. I have that written down wrong. 2 Timothy 3. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1 says, This know also, 
that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Perilous times shall come. You say, are we in those? I don't know. You tell me. I'll read it and you decide for yourselves if we're in the last days. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous. Boasters. Proud. Blasphemers. Oh yeah, God's name is never taken in vain. Disobedient to parents. Unthankful. Unholy. Without natural affection. Natural affection. That is actually talking about desiring the other half. Men with women and women with men. False accusers. Incontinent. Fierce. Despisers of those that are good. Traitors. Heady. High-minded. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power of. From such turn away. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Verse 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. These are not fun days to travel with the created order of God. It is all but the natural laws that we have not yet broken, like gravity and physics. But believe me, they are breaking their backs in labs trying to do that, having erased him from the existence of creation. They want God gone. And John sees all of this, and you know what he says? He looks at God's glory, and he looks at what he's getting. He's been resurrected. He is embodied once again, and he's perfected. And he looks, and he starts, he's like, this isn't fair. He's done all this for us. He died for us. He made us, and we're going to treat him this way? And his, his rule, his authority is never going to be seen They'll never submit to him. And John wept much. Years ago, I had taken, we had a, the first dog that Cherry and I ever had was a golden retriever. His name was Keebler. He was big, sweet, and dumb. We had taken, we called him Keebs. We had taken Keebs with us to Wisconsin. My dad's like, bring him. You know, I want to see him. I miss him. And so we brought Keebler with us, and he was running the acre and a half in all of the fields around my dad's house, and he's having the greatest time while we're out back playing catch. And Keebler starts running toward me, and he looks as happy as can be. He's just bounding and rebounding. He's just super excited, you know? He's like, Dad, this place is so awesome! Every paw push, he's just delighted. This is so great. This is so great. This is so great. This is so great. And as he gets close, I notice he's got like dirt all over himself. And it's like, key blur. You know, I wanted to make a good impression, bringing him into grandma's house, bringing him into Nana's house. And so, I mean, I had washed him, something fierce, trimmed his nails, trimmed his, he was looking good. We're playing in the yard first day. He comes back and he's all muddy. He comes running up and as he gets close, I'm like, I lean down, I'm like, Keeb, what are you doing, buddy? You're all dirty. And I lean down. He's happy. He wants to lick me. You know, he's just jumping all over. He's panting. He's like, Dad, this place is so great. It's so great. And I bent down to touch him, and it's just like, I got a little bit on my hands, and he stunk so bad. And I'm like, Keeb, what on earth? And my dad's like, uh-oh. I'm like, Pops, what's going on? He's like, I saw him over there rolling around. He goes, just so you know, that's where the neighbor dog does his business. Is it mud or is it not mud? <laughs> Only one way to find out. Oh, keep what's wrong with you? And he's as happy as can be like, Dad, you should smell my new smell. It smells so amazing. And I touched him and it was like, oh, I got to wash my hands and I got to wash my dog. And I'm like, keep. And he gets down on the ground like, what's the problem? He's confused. Dad, I have improved my existence for your pleasure. <laughs> Don't I, you can smell me from a mile away. I'm so happy and excited, and I touch it, and it's like, man, you know, we live in the world, and we roll around in the garbage of sin and refuse and greed and love and covetousness and materialism and cruelty to each other, judgmentalism and a lack of forgiveness, and we roll around it and say, what a great life. And we're going to get to heaven, and we're going to see it from God's perspective, and we're going to go, oh, was that me? And he's going to say, yeah, but don't worry, wash clean by the blood of the Lamb. Like, oh, wow. But you're going to be grief-stricken over the amount of wickedness that is in God's face. And John wept over it. 
That is a sign of righteousness. That is the present tense of righteousness in a man when he realizes how horrible sin actually is. Are you so in love with what Christ did, making you a righteous, redeemed saint, that when sin enters in and you realize it's there, it makes you feel gross, disappointed, frustrated? What was I thinking? Putting anything other than the Almighty first. This is disgusting. You know, unfortunately, Keebler never came to the place where he realized that rolling in doggy doo-doo was a bad idea. But a day is coming when you and I will. And to you that are redeemed, I say, why is that day not now? We ride the ridge of nervousness, and if God is the answer, well, then that means some pretty big things. And I'm going to go from nervous to weeping. Say, how do I know if I am redeemed? I'm nervous and I'm afraid. Does sin grieve you? That is a sign of the redeemed, not the lost. The lost don't grieve sin. They roll in it like dirty little puppy dogs who have no other idea, like a dog returning to its vomit. But the reality of sin in my life is the presence of the Holy Spirit saying, Yuck! Stop it! You are dragging me through garbage and I'm done! Enough! My child, I love you. Come back. I didn't punt Keebler to the back 40 and leave him. I brought him up to the house and I washed him. Why? Because he's precious. And so John, in a way that you and I will never get to, is like, man, sin is wretched. I can't believe we are treating God the way that we are treating him. Now, you'll kind of notice we've only made it through the first four verses. Don't worry by design. Next week, we are going to look at the king himself. But I want you to just look at the end of this story for the third scene. Some of you have been ravaged by your own failures. You think there's no hope. But I will tell you, you may have to wait till heaven, but hope is coming. You may fight sin, failures, habits your entire life and be grieved over the failures of your own scar tissue that never goes away. But a long time ago, I preached the message on the life of Moses, and the title of that message was that scars tissue doesn't matter in heaven. The only scars that matter in heaven are the ones that Jesus bears, not the ones that he's healed us from. They won't matter. Eventually, you'll be given a new vessel. And you'll wipe all tears from our eyes, and those will be good days, and they may not come until you're there, but they are coming. And the angel says in verse number five, weep not. There is a day that's coming when you won't have to weep over this anymore. The fight and the struggle will be over. The Redeemer will have come. But know this, number three, being thrilled is, a, is natural for the redeemed. It is exactly what happens to those that are redeemed. You will be thrilled. We skip the description in six because we're going to look at it next week. Seven, he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the land, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. You have guaranteed righteousness for all generations to come, including my own. You're going to take away all my failures and you're going to redeem the earth. The king has come and he still reigns. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. Do you see it? That's the celebration of having been resurrected. You've redeemed us. You have bought us back. And the transaction is complete. We are resurrected. You did exactly what you said you were going to do. Worthy is the lamb who has bought us back from the pit of destruction. How cool is that? Thou hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. You say, what is that? Sit tight. It's coming in several messages. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, the beasts, the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. So you have layers of glory being given to God. Every believer that's ever died, represented by the 24 seats around the throne, that's billions, billions of people that are born again, Round about the throne, none of us were worthy to take the scroll. Jesus appears, and the angels around us, you want to talk about a mega stadium. See how many angels are there? We don't know. But John describes it as millions of billions, is the way that he's describing it. Thousands times thousands, and thousands upon thousands. They all start crying, and it catches all of us up. I love it. John is a part of this thing, and he finds himself screaming like this, you know? And it's like, 
man, I'm screaming. Who's doing all that screaming? Oh, it's me. You know, it's like when you see a mouse and you hear, who oh, screamed at the mouse? You're like, oh, sorry, that was me. You know? It's like, ah! oh, who screamed? Oh, sorry. That I screamed at the mouse. Sorry about that. Didn't expect myself to do that. He's almost caught off guard by how much glory he gives God. And I heard myself saying, you're going to see this. Let's read it. It's too good. When he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and the twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Joining the angels and the saints, they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive sevenfold, wish we had time, power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all things that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. You ought to change the way you do your amens in church. Whew. Whew. You are not thankful enough for Jesus quite yet. The four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. We have never been a part of a church service this good. And I've been a part of some pretty awesome church services. I have seen God glorified at the cost of almost an entire body and life. And he has brought Nicole back from the edge of death and given her to us. And I thought, that is the best worship service I thought you could ever have. And Ron and Bev Force could walk in through the door. It's like, oh, I remember these. These are a good time. And then each of our ladies returned from the accident once again. Glory to God. And for each of you that has sacrificed house fires, cancer, you name it, God has been glorified. And I am telling you, we have never seen a worship service as good as the one that we will be a part of. You won't have to worry about being embarrassed. You won't have to worry about people hearing you singing from that hymn book because you'll be trying to outdo everyone else from the tippiest tips of your tippy toes. God is awesome and Jesus has redeemed me. Glory and honor, blessing and power be unto the Almighty, which is and was and has come. It's awesome. The king still reigns. And know this, that the redeemed experience greatness because the redeemed have been connected to the greatness of God. We go from nervous to grieving to thrilled because of who God is. That is a future that I am absolutely looking forward to. There's just one more point that I want to make and we're all done. If you would please go to John chapter 18. you imagine if I tried to preach the image of Jesus too? Might as well just bring in subs and just call it a day. Yeah. Renee and I are going to have a wonderful time together. No, I'm just kidding. All right. John chapter 18. I want to start in verse 1. I want to get to the invitation, but I want to start in verse 1 because I don't want you to miss how good this is. When I saw this, I was like, Lord, I'm all in. I'm all in. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the book of Kedron, where was a garden into which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. For Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples Jesus then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, cometh hither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? If you haven't caught it yet, he's in the garden. Judas has gone to the high priest and he has betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. They come to him. 
Judas with them, and Jesus asks, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. Judas also which betrayed him stood with them. And as soon as he said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Testify, yes, Christ the king is powerful. Oh, boy. <laughs> you guys, I, I, okay. Jason, could you come here for a second? You clearly aren't getting this. There's no possible way it's that you don't care. It's that you're suppressing all the good things that God is doing. I'm Pastor Boudreau, who are you? Nice. A lot of power there, huh? Squeeze harder. Oh, boy. <laughs> Only a little more if you would, please, sir. Okay, that's enough. Like, this guy's got a gorilla grip, right? Hi, I'm Pastor Boudreau. Give it a grip, man. Come on, like your dad raised you. Come on. Okay, that's enough right there. Okay, look at that. This guy works on semi-trucks for a living, yes? Trust me, we don't need to get into grip contests. I'm glad to have office hands. Praise the Lord, they turn... <laughs> They turn Bible pages wonderfully. They're so nice. I've worked to create such soft, supple skin. I told my dad, where are my calluses? He goes, praise the Lord, I don't have any either, you know? This guy does. That's a handshake. I find out a lot about this man's life and strength by the kind of grip he has to offer. They didn't shake the master's hand. He said, I am he. And they fell over backward. Come on. Christ is powerful. Go ahead, sit down, Jason. You're not going to be able to help me with this. <laughs> you guys, the Messiah that took away our sins, who cried out, it is finished, had so much power and authority when he said, their sins are paid for, it is finished, that when they came up to him and said, who are you looking for? Or when he said, who are you looking for? And they said, we're looking for Jesus. And he goes, that's me. Just identifying himself at the might of his goodness he fell backward. Amen. We're starting to get there. I'm not kidding. If you can't shout about these things, what is there to shout for? Christ is powerful and he is good and he has taken away all of my sins. And know this, at the declaration of his might, his enemies fall backward. But at the declaration of his entrance, his family falls forwards. And that got me. Man, that got me. I love that in John chapter 18 when he goes, I am he, and they all go, Pfft. it's like, yeah, get him. But a day is coming, Revelation chapter 5, an angel is going to be there, and we're going to be terrified. It's going to be like, oh, no, who's going to do this? What are we going to do? There's no hope. There's no help. And he goes, don't worry. There's one that's prevailed. He's the root of David. He is the Lion of Judah. And he's going to step out and everyone is going to say, that's him. And at that declaration, no one falls backward that day. We all fall forward. I want to fall forward in my life when it comes to Christ, not backward. I don't want to be apologizing for the things that I've been into. I want to be saying I love you for the things that I'm trying to do. That's enough falling backward. It's time to start falling forward. It's time to start loving him with every day, with our routine, with the things that we're reading and the things that we're watching, the way that we're talking to each other and the way that we're forgiving each other. It's time to start falling forward. That's enough falling backward because you are redeemed. You've been bought with the price. Nervousness is over. There is a season of grief. We're in it, but there is a time of thrill that's at hand. I can be forgiven. I can be right with God and King can be King in my life right now. He still reigns in my life. And so let's fall forward. What's got to go? What needs to change? Let's get thrilled. So that when we get there, that's not the first time we ever actually really worshipped. Father, as we close this service, and we look at the experience of John, knowing that we haven't even fully looked at the image of Jesus, Lord, we are overwhelmed, quite frankly. We are at awe. We are in awe of who you are and what your plan is. And I think even more, we're intimidated that 
um, you don't just care about us, you're really concerned about us and focused on us and invested in us. I think all of us would be comfortable with your glory being in this life about something other than being a member in a church and being a part of the church. And yet these are the seven letters you sent out, not to colleges or seminaries or politicians, not even government bodies, but to churches. Lord, it's not the government that has your eyes fixed. It's the way that we're treating you in our churches that does. And so may every knee bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lord, I believe that you gave us a glimpse of what it's going to be like then so that we could live that way now. This is what it means to live by faith. And so, Lord, you are calling us, and I know your Holy Spirit is stirring. I believe that there might be some here, certainly, that have never asked you to save them. Lord, today, I pray that they would find some place in this building during the invitation to get on their knees and say, please save me, bow the knee to the king and ask to be saved. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to your mercy, you save us. Oh Lord, that the sinner would cry out, take away my sins, knowing that Jesus did die, that he rose again and he wasn't just a man, he was God in flesh. So Lord, today, may today be the day of salvation for those that aren't saved. For those that are not a part of the family, they need not be afraid. Show them your goodness. And Lord, to those of us that are, there are those that are stagnant, not necessarily destroyed by sin, but not enthusiastic about who you are. Like the callous cowhide that's been henpecked, we feel you no more. Lord, help us to fall forward today. And for those that are troubled by sin in their life and think that there is no hope, may they accept the power of the Redeemer today. Cry out. Grab hold of the lifeline. Jesus wants to rescue us from a sin of failure and destruction to give us a life of worship and power and presence in the kingdom. And so be glorified during this invitation. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Would you stand to your feet while I give you some brief instruction? Go ahead and stand to your feet, heads bowed and eyes closed. Let me say this. If you're standing there right now and you know, you know that there is insecurity about being in the family of God because you know you've never repented, then can I ask you, what are you waiting for? If you have never repented, it isn't church, it's not the offering plate, it's not being busy, it's not good works, it's not volunteerism, it's not reading the Bible or praying or any of those things. Even if I bestow all of my goods and give them to the poor. But I have not been forgiven. Then I am nothing but sounding brass and a banging cymbal. My life is noise because I have not asked Jesus to save me today. If you have never repented and asked him to rescue you from sin in the world, but you want to do that today, then can I encourage you during the invitation, you can get on your knees at your seat, come up to the front, wherever you want. If you want, you can sit down. It doesn't matter to me, and you don't have to be on your knees for Jesus to forgive you. You could even do it standing up, but I am telling you, he's the king, and recognize him as such. Worship him with your life and ask him to save you during the invitation. While we're all standing here, heads bowed and eyes closed, and believers are responding, I trust that you'll pray. Now to those that are believers, you know what needs to happen now. And all I am telling you is do it. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. Years ago, pastor was doing an invitation. I was not a pastor. I was studying. And he preached a sermon, and it just kind of felt like a clunker that day. I could tell by the end of the service, he was discouraged, and I thought, man, no one is going to respond in the invitation. And no way, this was such a clunker. We get to the invitation. He asks for a raise of hands. I look around. No hands go up. So I stuck my hand up. I wanted him to be encouraged. God hadn't stirred in my life, but I felt bad for him. So I raised my hand.
And then um, during the invitation to encourage him, I went forward and prayed. And I prayed about the message, but I, I wasn't there out of conviction. I was there because I was trying to be an encouragement to the pastor. So I went forward. That Sunday when I was leaving, he grabbed my hand in a really affectionate way that he never had before. And he pulled me with kind of immediately tears are forming in his eyes. And he thanked me and gave God glory for the Lord working in my life. And I thought, oh man, I better do that again next week. That was such an encouragement to him. And so there was a season in my life I went forward during the church because I thought it made the pastor happy for a while. And so this I say, it would have been better for me to worship from the spot I was in than to go to the front because I did it out of pride. But I will tell you this, there are times when to the front is the right place to be. It is the only place to be. So maybe today it's time to fall forward in your life. God is moving. And you're either going to get to be a part of what's going on or you're going to be left behind. And so I say, jump in. Don't fall backward, fall forward. And so today, you want to come to the front, come to the front. You want to try and figure out how to get on your knees where you are, I'm fine with that. You want to sit down, great. Be genuine in your relationship with the Lord and worship the King because I tell you this, He still reigns. And it ought to be in our hearts. There's things you need to get right with the master. Get him right. He's forgiving, good, kind, gentle, and ready to redeem you. Father, as we move into the invitation and the piano plays, stir in our hearts that the response would be void of pride. Absolutely authentic, genuine, enthusiastic, personal, and above all, glorifying to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed as Sister Twyla plays just a little bit on the piano. Let's make this place not a house of preaching, but a house of prayer. Would you please talk to the Lord? Come to the front, get on your knees. Where you are is fine, but go forward, don't go back. You have never asked Jesus to save you. What are you waiting for? He's knocking. Open the door to him and ask him to forgive you. You can know that you're a part of God's family. Father, as we get ready to conclude this service, I am so thankful for Faith Baptist Church. I'm so very thankful for my salvation. I'm thankful for what you're doing. <laughs> oh Lord, dare I say it, I'm thankful for the pandemic. Because I believe that you have primed our pump. and You have brought us to a place my whole life I watched the plate being passed and never thought anything of it other than my responsibility to you with my finances. But now, Lord, we're in church and I see the plate passed and I think, man, the Lord is good. You have taken us from some pretty tough times. Lord, the truth is, if life were a multiple choice, we would choose the easiest route and we would never know how good you are. And so by your almighty hand, in a way that only you can do, you take bad things and you do great things with it. And there have been some very difficult seasons that we have pushed through here at Faith Baptist Church. Lord, people see the, the balance in savings and the building and the property and they think, wow, this is exciting. 
For ten years I have ached for space in an auditorium where we could say, and yet there is room. But I believe that it is these difficult times which have brought us to a place of deep worship and appreciation. Lord, you are moving and space doesn't matter. And I'm thankful for that. Thankful for the faithfulness of your children, for the way that you are developing us. And I have no doubt that today was a significant day, both in our lives and in our church history. As we move forward from this place, may we be all in. May we have the shout of the redeemed. For the King still reigns and you are an awesome God. I'm ready to follow you, Lord. And I trust that you will not take us into anything beyond what we are able to handle through your good grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you would please grab your hymn books, number 496. Brother Paul, would you please go get Pastor Matt and the junior church kids? They're ready. They just needed a voice to come and get them. They're going to join us. I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory. How He gave His life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about His groaning and of His precious blood atoning. And I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew Him and all my love is due Him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. As soon as the junior church kids get up here, and we'll just wait awkwardly for them. You can take just a moment to think about the way you plan on singing this song. Sound good? Are they coming? Oh, yes, guys, come on up. We're about to close the service, but we didn't want to do it without you. Come on up, guys. You can go back to your families. Come right to the front if you want. Yeah, I love it. Pastor Matt, you got a couple young guys right up here in the front. They're ready for you, sir. We're going to sing Victory in Jesus. Do you guys know it? Oh, yeah. I want you guys to sing louder than your parents do. All right, come on in. There you go, guys. Perfect. Come on in. We're going to sing Victory in Jesus. You guys can stand up with us. Pastor Matt's going to come and close the church service and prayer as soon as we're done. But we wanted our whole church family together. I wish the nursery were in here, but their singing's a little bit different, so we'll let them <laughs> cry downstairs for the time being. Moms, as you go and pick up your little ones, would you please say thank you to the nursery staff? They make all of this possible. Praise the Lord for that. Number 496, let's sing with all of our hearts. You guys ready? I heard an old, old story how the Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin, and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew Him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Pastor Matt, would you please close us in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today and the gift that we gave to you of our worship, Lord. I pray that as we go through this week, Lord, that we meet give you our heart and every effort that we can muster to show you how we love you in each and every moment of this week. Thank you for loving us. In your name I pray. Amen.